Uh, thank you, um, Frank, for the introduction and for being our big host here in the center. It's been a pleasure to uh, be your colleague uh, in Harvard Divinity School. And thanks for, uh, to our friends who have come, uh, the dean, uh, my senior colleagues, and friends and students. Uh, let me begin by, uh, first of all, saying how much it is that I appreciate my stay in the Center for the Study of World Religion. And as most of you will probably remember, I like telling the story that when I was a graduate student in Boston, this was almost a forbidden place for those of us studying African religion because we weren't studying the high religions. Uh, we used to people in India and say, what are they doing here? Uh, well, uh, thank God uh, things have changed and we are now legitimate members of the academy here. My approach would be as follows. First, I will speak about how I chose this topic and how, or maybe how it chose me. Second, I will focus on a few themes in the book. And thirdly, I will reflect on my experiences writing the book and its reception, both in the United States as well as in Nigeria. There's an album that is uh, you know, with you there. And that's the album that came out of the book launch that um, we had in uh, Nigeria. Uh, to begin with, it is fair to say that the book is a sequence to my first book, Religion, Rituals, and Kingship, in the Nigerian community. The first book serves as a revision of about one third of my PhD thesis. Uh, the remaining two thirds have yet to be published, and they may not be published. In my first book, I provide more complex understanding of Yoruba religious tradition by arguing that beyond the three phases of Nigerian religious uh, heritage, that is Islam, Christianity, and indigenous religion, there lies an invisible face, that of civil religion, represented in the ideology and rituals of the sacred kingship. I also argue that contrary to theorists of Yoruba religious uh, tradition and African religious pluralism, particularly uh, Robin Houghton, that this fourth dimension of civil religion in Nigeria represented for me an equally significant element or religious reality in Yoruba land. The notion of a sacred kingship, for instance, provides insight into the concept of sacred canopy as explained by my former teacher, Peter Boger, that is the sacred kingship acting as a sacred canopy under which the Yoruba religious and social spaces are subsumed and regulated. The three religious traditions are protected by the king. Secondly, the sacred kingship functionally differs from the Orisha tradition. And the Christians and Muslims will refer to Orisha tradition as paganism. So it is very different from, from it. The sacred kingship was able to make claim to a higher moral ground than the three religious practices, including the Orisha tradition itself. Uh, it was in the rituals of the sacred kingship that the Ondo people that I studied then responded to various aspects of European modernity. This thesis allows us to reaffirm and acknowledge the extent of Yoruba religious pluralism. We can also say that the ideological ingredients for this affirmation came from Orisha tradition, revealing an almost inherent pluralism in the indigenous cosmology. So the king's participation in the three religious traditions signified in the local idiom of Baonibubuesi, meaning the king as a custodian of four traditions. So in addition to these three traditions, the king also had his own tradition as the fourth dimension. That was the thing that defined my earlier scholarship because it was not uh, seen uh, in the earlier uh, uh, understanding and interpretation of African relig uh, uh, religion. 20 years after writing this first book, I noticed a significant change 
in the religious landscape of Yoruba communities. Unlike the 70s and 80s, where the sacred kings took seriously the tenets of this civil faith, in the 80s, they began to denounce the reality of this sacred canopy and also began to participate in what I have referred to as Nigerian second phase of conversion to charismatic and Pentecostal Christianity. And hence, the role they played as mediators in providing this pluralistic worldview of Yoruba spheres that existed was being challenged and questioned even by these, these same people. So suddenly, the Yoruba Christians and Muslims rulers became more concerned with the salvation of the individual souls than the collective group's salvation. It was as if the sacred kings themselves began to deny the reality of their own divinity, to question it. And in fact, about a month ago, I was uh, there, and one of the kings did uh, what was almost a taboo. He removed his cap in the church. Um, you know, I happened to be the king of my hometown. So in other words, this king loved their, they, they, they loved their crown as it represented the power of kingship. However, they have been made to despise the rituals that gave meaning and legitimacy to their roles as kings in the first instance. So I decided then that the best place to re-examine this second phase of conversion would be Ilefe, Nigeria. Not only was this city the site of the university where I had worked, but it also serves as the center of the Yoruba religious universe itself. The world was created in Ilefe, as the Yoruba myth of creation claims. The cosmology explains that there is a, uh, there is a festival or ritual performed every day for 364 days of the year. In fact, there is only one day in the entire whole year when ritual is not performed in Ilefe. And it used to be a kind of a riddle until I did my feed work when I confirmed that this day was the day of creation because nobody had time to perform any ritual that day. <laughs> uh, secondly, it is well known that Ilefe is a city where even the initiated fear to, to tread, a truly challenging city. Suddenly, after my study, of the city of Ondo, I became emboldened, both in my research and my field experience, to encounter Ilefe in all its mysterium tremendum. And having been trained in the phenomenological and anthropological traditions of the West, I wanted to demonstrate in my studies that it was not necessary to be initiated into any sacred societies to be able to study Ilefe with insights and respect for tradition, and I know I have some of my students here who believe in initiation who will challenge this fact. <laughs> Additionally, I was fortunate to have my father as the Anglican Archdeacon of this city between 1974 and 1949. So as a missionary, he worked in the city for almost a decade and left a lasting impression and legacy in this place. So as such, beginning this research endeavor in the city was not as restricted for me. In my research, I became close to the king of Ilefe, the owner of Ife, who in Yoruba society is regarded as a god himself, the last of the 201 gods in the universe. The Oni also serves as the political heir to the mythic founder of Yoruba uh, uh, kingdom, Odudua. Subsequently, my field research took place over many years more than two to three decades to finish this book, which gave me the chance to observe many scenes and many rituals and many festivals on numerous uh, occasions. The City of 201 Gods. Uh, the book provides a variety of themes and motives, all with an eye towards uh, uh, the history of religions or the comparative history of religion. As a place, the city of Ife, Nigeria, uh, um, uh, can be located in this very broad uh, uh, historical uh, uh, context. We should remember that the cultural geographer Paul Whitley, in his classics, Pivot of Four Quarters, a preliminary inquiry into the origins and character of ancient Chinese city, mentioned Ilefe as a focal point for understanding the sacredness of ancient cities. So one of the reasons why I studied this city 
uh, at that time was that Ilefe was the only city mentioned by, uh, uh, by him that was not studied at that particular time. And it was the only city in the entire continent, uh, continental Africa, that, uh, that uh, Whitley uh, uh, cited. So drawing from the interdisciplinary fields of cultural studies, phenomenology, and anthropology of religion, I assert that we cannot allow Western discourse to dictate the meaning and function of African religion. We must understand what it's all about. Then the book then introduces what we may call an indigenous hymenotics. That is, the exploration of paradigms and modes of interpretation that are explicitly embedded in the tradition we study. So I begin with the assumption that these traditions are interpretive traditions and that we must look very carefully at what they are exposed, I mean, telling us to be able to begin these kinds of hymenotical uh, exercise. I also argue that religion is essentially pre-theoretical and exists as a unique and broadly encompassing structure society that is far more complex than what we may identify as simply an intellectual exercise. So I, I included certain frame in questions, such as how do the Yoruba themselves experience their world in a vast fashion that can be called religious? Or what are the lasting influences of the three historical legacies of secular modernism, uh, colonial uh, Christianity, and Islam? The book is divided into many parts, I try to uh, provide uh, 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 historical, ethnographic uh, uh, structures of the city. I moved to examining uh, sets of rituals in the second part. I investigate the rules of rituals and festivals for the gods. And finally, in the last part of the work, I included my own exchanges with the Oni, uh, the, the king in the, last, in the past 15 years and also considered the new yet significant presence of evangelical movements in that city. It's very surprising that 30 minutes ago, I got, I got a call from the wife of the king. And he had never called me before. Um, you know, wanted to discuss, uh, the, the, the only saint had to tell me uh, uh, something. Um, the work, uh, as it is, enables me to re-examine notions of gender, conversion, sacred space, and time, popular culture, notion of play and ritual, sacrifice, etc. The unforeseen consequences will be that while I honestly think that the work's primary focus was on indigenous tradition and how the ancient sacred kinship that supported a civil tradition has been challenged, questioned, and denounced. To my surprise, it turned out that scholars and general readers were equally interested in the theme of conversion and Pentecostal charismatic movements. Everywhere I went, and I'll discuss this thing, they bring me back to it. That's what we're, they're interested in, which is almost a reflection of the problem itself, that, you know, why I decided to do the book. That is, people were interested in those forms of religious traditions that tend to render impossible the structures of the whole tradition as represented in sacred kingship. So this, for me, indicated that the civil religion is slowly becoming a non-civil religion as the king and his wives become more closely affiliated with the new Pentecostal religious communities in Yoruba land. This is in part because in the palaces of the kings, the Oloris, and the one I spoke with was the one who actually built the, the chapel. The, the, the king was in England, and before he came back, he had laid the foundation for a local chapel in Ilefe Palace, which is a taboo. And the priest rebelled against that. But when the king came back, he couldn't do anything about it. Responses to the book. In concluding, I will briefly share some of the reactions to my book, as well as some of the conversations that followed uh, uh, this publication. Firstly, and as I have alluded to, even though the city of Tuana Ungos was meant to be a work in indigenous religion, as it relates to this city, I realized that his publication, uh, that, uh, that the old publication sort of opened a kind of a Pandora box on the question of Pentecostalism and evangelical Christianity. The book's conclusion begins to address the dynamics of this relatively new development. But I soon realized that 
I will need to begin working on another project devoted entirely to this type of topic or to evangelical Pentecostalism in Yoruba land to be able to really make meaningful sense of that. Secondly, there emerged all kinds of questions that people raised about the implications of my research and my supposed connection to such a topic. Many people inquired as to whether I was involved in Orisha tradition itself. It was clear that I was being judged by my supposed proximity to the Orisha's topic. It is true that the religious transformation of Yoruba land related to the growing power and prevalence of evangelical communities has greatly marginalized indigenous uh, religion and has also had significant impacts on cultural heritage and tradition, which are now seen as the work of the devil, particularly by the Pentecostal, uh, evangelical Pentecostal uh, groups. And, and as such, there emerged a number of questions about my own motivation behind the work on Eleife, religion and tradition. Indeed, my own saving grace was that I came from a long line of Anglican uh, uh, tradition, and this lineage made it difficult to discount me. You can't say I'm not a believer uh, as far as Christianity is concerned, because the lineage uh, history is very clear. But there were also occasions when I had to play safe. And this was a, and I remember one particular case when I was going to be embarrassed by uh, the, uh, one of the priests of Ifa, and there were 10 of, 10 of them. I was the only one who was not a devotee to Orisha. And they asked me, Akawe, uh, they used to call me the writer, Akawe, <laughs> what is your own Orisha? What do you really, you know, worship? And I looked around and I said, oh, uh, why are you asking me this question? You should know better. You know I'm a twin myself. I'm, I'm a beji. Is the, the head of the Orisha itself. <laughs> so uh, you can't be asking me about my Orisha. When you are talking to, to Orisha, the diviners, they, they just dropped their thing. They were kind of reeling on the floor because, and they looked at, I think, uh, Shiva, I mean, Professor, I want their people, and say, this Yakawe is, uh, is, is a kind huh, of a man. Huh? So I was able to do that. In regards, to, in, in regards to the book's reception, uh, at the book launch in Nigeria, I was honored to receive the owner himself, who had sponsored this event. Every person that mattered in Yoruba community showed up to attend the event. They wanted to know about Ilife, the, the very mysterious city. In fact, it was a wonderful irony, because even as the Oni denounced his godlike status, because the book is also about him, a topic discussed at length in the, in the conclusion of this book, the citizens of Yoruba <laughs> land see fit to attend any event that he hosts. So they came in large uh, 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 number. So I went at, at a certain time, they asked me, what is your relationship with this, with this man? My response was to cite a passage from the transfiguration uh, story of Jesus. And I quote him, and I said, in, I said it, of course, in Yoruba, this is my beloved father in whom I am well pleased. Again, another interesting response to that. So in other words, I used the Christian narrative to convince the askers of this question that I was not involved in the court of the Orni as they were there. That's why they were going. You must be a member of a secret society doing things with the Orni, and you're pretending here. So I gave a Christian answer to that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, question. Lastly, the book is celebrated in Nigeria uh, partly because the Yoruba elites have always been puzzled by the Ilif uh, mistake. Indeed, it is perhaps this aspect of, uh, of which I'm most proud of, that for me, a native scholar has finally written an accessible yet scholarly work for them to read about their past and their present. So the book serves as a reminder that Africans have often been the narrators of their own cultural and religious history and encourages a, a continued in, in investment in such indigenous hermeneutics and the engagement of ethnic voices from the content. And I should just make a passing remark that uh, we've always you know, invited uh, uh, outsiders to study us. You know, Yoruba studies is perhaps the most studied in Africa. And, the, the, and Yoruba scholars themselves will refer to people like Peel, uh, uh, Karen Baba at Birmingham, Peel as the doe of Yoruba. They, they have no problem with that. But what is very problematic for us is when now people start beginning to say 
that you don't understand your own thing. We have a better understanding and interpretation of this, of this, of this work. So then, of course, the response is for us to kind of go into action and then uh, generate a debate, which we often don't run away from. So let me just stop. Thank you very much. Jacob, thank you very much for getting us off to a wonderful start. Uh, so we are happy today to have two very fine discussants for the book. Um, it was made clear to them in inviting them to come that they're, they're not required to do book reports or summarize everything in such rich a book, but rather to bring out angles of it and questions of particular interest. So I will introduce them both and then turn the microphone over to them. Our first discussant is Laura Grillo, who I'm happy to say is a fellow here at Harvard Divinity School this semester and has been around for many of our events, so it's good to, to have you here. Uh, professor Grillo is a professor at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara, California, where she has been teaching for the past 10 years. She has a Master of Divinity degree from Union Theological Seminary and her PhD in the History of Religions at the University of Chicago, where she specialized in African religions. Uh, Laura lived for about seven years in Africa in Cote d'Ivoire and in Kenya, where she taught in both public and private schools and served in program development at the All African Conference of Churches in Nairobi. Her postdoctoral work on divination in Cote d'Ivoire was sponsored by the NEH, American Academy of Religion, West African Research Association. And this work um, culminated in a number of publications, including in 2010, an essay entitled, When You Make Sacrifice, No One is a Stranger, Divinization, Divination, Sacrifice and Identity Among Translocals in the West African Urban Diaspora, and the article, Divination, Epistemology Agency in the Construction of Identity in Contemporary West Africa in Blackwell's Religious Compass, Religion Compass. Uh, Laura is a gifted writer and a versatile writer. Uh, she has written a memoir about her haunting return to Cote d'Ivoire, her marriage there, and her uncanny experiences among Ivoirian diviners. Um, the work called Ask for the Road has won many prizes and awards and invitations to, um, to teach writing and to aid younger scholars in the writing project. Uh, Laura, um, in part while here, but a larger project, is now working on a new book project, tentatively entitled Female Genital Power in Ritual and Politics in Cote d'Ivoire. It is based on fieldwork of ritual spanning a 30-year period, linking it to the current aftermath of the recent civil war in that country. A recent article on the topic, Violation and Deployment of Female Genital Power, appeared recently in Cultural Anthropology's Hotspots Forum. And she recently gave a paper on a similar topic at uh, the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. So Laura will be our first respondent. And then we have a second, Professor Nimi Wariboko, who is the Catherine B. Stewart Professor of Christian Ethics at Andover Newton Theological School, so a neighbor of ours not too far away. Uh, Professor Wariboka has a very, I was fascinated knowing nothing about the business world. I was always impressed by this. Uh, he was a strategy consultant to top investment banks um, on Wall Street for a period of time, so has expertise in business. His um, BS degree in economics is from University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria. His MBA in finance and accounting is from Columbia University in New York. His MDiv degree from Oral Roberts University and his PhD in uh, Princeton Theological Seminary in Princeton. So you can see bringing together the worlds of economics and the worlds of theology and ministry. Um, before coming to Andover Newton, he was adjunct assistant professor of social sciences at New York University and at the Frank Zarb School of Business at Hofstra University, also in the New York area. Uh, he came to Andover Newton in 2007. So his work, as you can tell from this introduction, focuses on economic ethics, the intersection of business and religion, ethics of monetary systems, economic development and social theory, and more recently, Pentecostal theology in Nigeria. Um, his, re his books, his many books, include these, in 2008, God and Money, A Theology of Money in Globalizing World, 2009, The Principle of Excellence, A Framework for Social Ethics, 
2010, you do a book every year, it seems. Uh, 2010, Ethics and Time, Ethos of Temporal Orientation in Politics and Religion in the Niger Delta, 2011. Uh, the Pentecostal Principle, Ethic, Ethical Methodology in New Spirit. And he is um, currently completing another book, 2013 probably, <laughs> um, The Spell of the Invisible Pentecostal Spirituality in Nigeria. So we're fortunate to have two very rich and diverse experts to uh, open the book discussion for us. I think Laura will go first. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, it's really an honor and a privilege to be called to be a respondent to the, such a wonderful work and, uh, and to honor my friend Jacob Olapuna. Jacob, this is really a masterful work, uh, obviously emerging from decades of dedicated field work. City of 201 Gods guides the readers through vivid ritual cycles of Ile Ife the axis mundi of Yoruba traditions, led by the sensitive and probing insights of this native Yoruba scholar. It, it shows this ancient city to be the seat of both religious and political authority for enormously, this enormously influential confederation of kingdoms. Especially early in the book, he draws on archival material and archaeological findings to attest to Ileife's Ile enduring preeminence from Nigeria to Benin, as well as its significance for early explorers, for missionaries, and for scholars alike. Of course, it's well known that the Yoruba tradition, and especially its core ritual, Ifa divination, has been the mother of multiple religious offspring in the African diaspora, giving birth to Santeria, Candomblé, and uh, numerous other traditions in the Caribbean and the Americas. So these opening historical chapters persuasively depict already Ileife as the sacred religious center on a par with other sacred cities like Benares and Jerusalem and Mecca. The core of the book, though, are a cluster of five chapters that each presents a close ethnographic description of a festival celebrating a principal deity. The thick descriptions of these complex ritual performances portray them as living, a living mythology whose symbolism is the wellspring of what Olapuna calls the socio-spatial identity of the Yoruba. He offers us exacting accounts replete with primary oral texts, as he calls them, oral texts, prayers, incantations, proverbs, and lyrics, both in Yoruba and in English. This is really a treasure trove of material. Uh, it serves as, as he calls it, an indigenous hermeneutics in its own right, just having these materials there. And together, these five chapters detail the vivid ritual life of the city, where the ceremonies are ubiquitous and ongoing. Olupuna manages to capture these Orisha traditions as ancient, yet far from static. He shows how they've been constantly recast, as devotees have grappled with history, facing challenges that have ranged from successive incursions by rival African peoples, to colonial domination and the trappings of modernity, to the influence of the increasingly visible and militant forms of Christianity and Islam. With an uncompromising gaze, Olupuna recognizes that, like other sacred centers, Ileife has therefore long been the locus of contested power and violent conflict, and ongoing ideological battles that are not over. So ultimately, this work contributes to a scholarly effort to preserve for posterity a tradition that Olupuna surmises may not survive the latest pressures of globalization. From the outset, he tells us that his intention is to develop a new and responsible hermeneutic that challenges Western conceptions by drawing on a method methodological pr approach of participant observer or participant insider. And from his privileged position as a Yoruba insider, 
as well as a consummate scholar, Olupona is an able mediator. But in a particularly self-revelatory passage, he also represents himself as a researcher caught between his status as a Yoruba and a citizen of Ile Ife, and also as an outsider to the initiatory tradition he was investigating. He candidly shares his internal struggle between using his privileged position to gain access to a deeper levels of knowledge for the sake of his study, and on the other hand, his own sense of identity and integrity as a Christian and son of an Anglican priest. I found this a moving passage, and this self-conscious acknowledgement, moreover, of his ambivalent position lends a postmodern texture to his account, both in its self-revelatory nature and in the very dilemmas that it, it was re revealing. <coughs> in addition, Olupuna quotes at length interviews with informants, allowing them to explicate symbolic and ritual images and key cultural motifs in their own words, acknowledging their profound awareness of the meanings of these seemingly cryptic acts to which we're privy through his rich descriptions. So he astutely notes how his informants repeatedly co-opted the interpretive idioms of Christianity and Islam to articulate their own worldviews and explain their practices. And in so doing, Olupona bears witness to the way indigenous Orisha traditions and foreign religions have infiltrated one another. But more importantly, he underscores are the reflexivity of the indigenous actors themselves. So this adds a multivocal dimension to his work. And in all these ways, then, he achieves a metho his methodological aim, which, as he said, is, was to bring together two often unrelated theoretical discourses, the hermeneutics of the indigene and anthropology of religion. Now, one of the most remarkable things, I think, that characterizes this work is its explicit concern for issues of gender and power. Throughout this book, Olupuna intentionally subverts the usual patriarchal interpretation of mythology surrounding goddesses, he challenges Western conceptions of gender itself. He gives ample attention to the critical role and the status of women, a subject that he himself notes is usually neglected by the prevailing male-centered scholarly discourse surrounding Yoruba religion. Precisely because attention to women's agency and import is still so rare in religious studies, this aspect of the book deserves more than a brief acknowledgement, so hence my, my focus on it. And let me give you some examples of how three of these central chapters make gender and female agency so key. Chapter five focuses on the Itapa festival for the primordial couple, Obatala and Yemo. Obatala, god of purity, wields moral rather than political power. And mythology depicts his spouse, though, to possess such an innate spiritual power and energy that she's this bloated and insatiable, bloodthirsty creature. For this reason, she's associated with the dangerous power of witches who control the life force that blood symbolizes. But according to the myth, her appetite and these sinister aspects of her are subdued by Ifa, who magically makes this once barren woman able to procreate. So Olupuna is quick to undermine the usual patriarchal interpretation of this narrative. So instead of making the tale about how maternity tames the wild beast in woman, he shows it to be a comment on traditional Yoruba ideology of gender that considers innate female powers to be so great that they can only be restrained by the equally potent forces of magic. Chapter 7 features the goddess Moremi and the rituals attended to her. Its central purpose is to consider gender and the critical role of women in Yoruba society. Moremi's story is a classic tale of a hero sacrifice that delivers Ile Ife from Igbo incursions and slavery. She's a Yoruba Delilah who uses her beauty and seductive wiles to wed the enemy king in order to discover the secret of his people's warrior might. Her revelations then allow her people to triumph, but in exchange for her success, she must fulfill her promise to the river spirit, and that 
that she would make a sacrifice, and that sacrifice ends up to be her only child. For both her seductive power and the sacrifice of her offspring, she's known as, quote, the courageous woman who used her vagina to conquer the Igbo. That's her praise name. Olapuna shows how the story contests masculinized conceptions of heroism and also complicates traditional notions of gender and power in Yoruba society. So here, too, he's playing a very postmodern hand by by making place for a critical female figure who represents woman's ability to defy gender roles and surpass gender limitations, which the Yoruba call bottom power. That is referring to her, her, her private parts and the locus of this power. And chapter eight examines a 14-day festival honoring Odudua, the fashioner of human beings, whose cult is esoteric and restricted to men. Now, he inquires into the easily overlooked but critical participation of women in Odudua's rituals that ostensibly exclude them. In doing so, in actually inquiring further about women's participation, he learns from the chief priest that there was no part of Odudua tradition that women did not know about. And that's a quote. Moreover, citing missionary archives dating back to 1889, he notes that Odudua was worshipped as a goddess and that the priestess of Odudua held more power than the local civil leaders. Excuse me. This is a kind of, this kind of critical information is the kind that many male predecessors would have easily ignored or perhaps even suppressed. And it opens avenues for new assessments of gender ideology, gender relations, and their changes in African tradition. In an, an unexpected twist, the last section departs from the most, what preceded it was almost reverential documentation of these living traditions. Um, and this section, the last part, inquires into the rumors that the Ooni, the Yoruba king of kings, had renounced his divine status, capitulating to evangelical Christianity. This part was so captivating because it's really written in a tone of Breathless urgency. The section uh, lets us follow Olopuna back to Ile Ife in 2004, the year after he thought his, he had completed his field work for the book, and witness with him the profound shift in the religious climate. There he learns that the born again wife of the, of the Ooni, the Olori, built a Christian chapel for her private devotions in the royal palace court as he told us. And then she opened it for services to the public. So the chapel and its services initiated a kind of silent contest for the religious domination at the very heart of Ile Ife's sacred core in the royal palace. Excuse me. The extracts from the transcripts between Jacob and the king and queen show Olopuna courageously confronting the royal couple about the ramifications of their personal religious choices on the indigenous Orisha tradition that they are expected to represent as instantiations of divine lineage. He challenges their indifference to, if not outright support of, a growing religious exclusivism and intolerance in the city under the influence of this increasingly militant form of Christianity and Islam that's been so divisive. The extensive excerpts are intimate and gripping. One really feels in Olapuna's questions and in his subsequent analyses both respect for their personal dignity and faith and also his shock for the degree to which the traditions have been put in jeopardy by their capitulation to fundamental Christian propositions. Again, we see the decisive role women have played in the landscape. Women comprise 70% of this new evangelical movement. And as we've seen, it's the Christian fervor of the king's wife that led the Ooni to renounce his divine status. Her influence effectively pulled the linchpin from the sacred system of Ile Ife. Olapuna suggests that it is ironically the African diaspora community that may offer the greatest hope for the future of Ile Ife 
as the pressures of the external community exert a buttressing force on this city, upholding it as a sacred center. IFA divination has been uh, so pivotal, um, at the pivotal rit Yoruba ritual at the heart of many of, is at the heart of many of the burgeoning traditions in the diaspora in the Americas and the Caribbean. And more and more, the faithful from the diaspora make regular pilgrimage to Ile Ife, especially to attend the Ife festival there, calling it their Mount Arafat. The influx of pilgrims fortifies their sense of identity, even as their presence visibly reinforces the sacrality of the spiritual city. So now, understood as a globally viable religion with strongholds in the Americas and the Caribbean Arisha tradition is drawing strength from this kind of reverse mission and into Ile'ife as a site of pilgrimage. So the tradition's most promising strategy for survival appears to be the ability to capitalize on its global status and to mobilize a transnational quest to see the city's symbolic significance restored in this way. In conclusion, there's just so much, so much abundant and suggestive material in this work. Uh, it offers so many avenues and possibilities for further exploration that it's truly a gift. This text has brilliantly opened the way into still uncharted territory. And for this, I, all of this work and for that opening, I really thank you, Jacob, for this work. Um, I have questions, but maybe we'll leave them till later. Thank you, Professor Cloney, and um, for inviting me, and also thank Professor Jacob Kainde Odukwana for for a book that brings us together. I've titled my response, The King's Five Bodies, Pentecostals in the Sacred City, and the Logic of Interreligious Dialogue, because I felt um, part of the book also calls for how do these two religions, even Islam and uh, Christianity and the traditional, how could they coexist in, in the light of the role that the king plays as a, as a sacred king and also in this role as a civil civil religion. So, so I will read um, excerpts from the, the paper. It, it led me to write a much more detailed paper, but I'll read excerpts uh, from it to get the idea of that we need to read from Ulukwana's work. He has raised issues about the political theory of the Oni, and we need to explore that further. So I says, we are gathered here to discuss uh, Professor Jacob Ulukwana's latest book, The City of 2001 God's Ileife in Time, Space, and Imagination. His effort is a first rate introduction to African religious thought and philosophy and a pleasant, sophisticated discourse of the same. Through this book, Olupuna has fed the religious and theological academy with a fresh bread of scholarship and the savory meat of rigorous research. He has said something to us in his knowledge production. That is, we can no longer remain behind the security of brilliant old ideas and methodologies to produce knowledge about African religion. More importantly, the book exceeds its author's location in African religious tradition. His discourse is one of political theology and political philosophy. Olupona definitely lays out the glory of power in Yoruba that is the ceremonial, the liturgical, and the acclamatory aspects that accompany sovereignty. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is not how I intend to proceed. We are not engaging in the usual book review or response, but thinking is taught after him. Using this approach, we hope to advance the flight of thought Olupona has launched in order to offer valuable insights into his political theory. We will need the strong feathers supplied by political philosophy and political theology to fly towards his son of enlightenment, hoping that unlike Icarus, our wings will not be burnt before we reach our goal. <laughs> I respond to this book in three interrelated ways, using different interpretative lenses, and with each pass, 
I change the focus of my reading. This is not because my readings inevitably change each time I poured over the book between September 4, 2012 and March 23, 2013. Time is not a dynamic force here. The characters in the book are, as in Justin Gardner's novel, Sophia's Wall. Past great figures of Yoruba cosmos talk and take walks with the readers of Olupona's book. Several of them have been inviting me to tell their stories, to take them out of Ileife and bring them to the Sophia drenched halls of Harvard. Be careful, the gods and goddesses are our guests today. On my first reading of the book in September 2012, this is what I recorded as my observation. Immensely beautiful and painstakingly done, weaving together astute theoretical debates, personal observation, multidisciplinarity, and forward thinking. Ulupona anal analyzes and interprets the data of Ilaife's sacred status on their own terms. What is also remarkable about his approach is, is that he does not impose any theoretical framework on the data to force them to speak or dance in a particular academic way. The data and the experience speak for themselves in voices that harmonize and resonate with one another. If the book were a sculpture, I will compare it to the work of the famous Nigerian-born British artist Sukari Douglas Camp, in the sense that the characters literally Liter the characters are literally speaking, dancing, and rejoicing on the pages of the book, threatening all the time to jump out and enact their shoes. All this means that he captured the spirit of the sacred kinship, the city, the festival, and the people and their worldview and ethos. We are all in his debt and are proud of his accomplishment. I came back to the book last January after I'd been asked by the Center for the Study of World Religion to respond to it. This time around, I had a slightly different impression. On first blush, although Africans don't blush, on first blush, <laughs> it's worth speaking in English. On first blush, Ulupona's book ceased to be about Holy Land. On the second, I found that it is actually not about Holy Land, but about the story of sacred kinship woven around the awe of a city. Dig deeper and we discover that it's about the perpetuation of kinship across gaps of successions and the status of royal power as the font and foundation of all other power in Yoruba land. Whence comes so much power? The fullness of the owner's power correlates with his five bodies. Yes, I'm going to argue that the European tradition of the king's two bodies, which Ernest Cataways explained in detail in, 19, in his 1957 book, is inadequate to interpret the political theology of royal sovereignty in Ileife. I have another reason for, focuses, for, for focusing on the political theory and political theology of the Yoruba kingship. It, it provides us with some principles of interfaith dialogue, especially in the light of Ulupona's concern about conflicts between Pentecostal Christianity and African traditional religion in Ileife. And now the king five bodies. According to Katowitz, the sovereign, the European sovereign, the European king, is endowed with two bodies, body natural and body politic. The natural body, the body, body corporal, is physical and subject to decay, error, aging, and death, like all human beings. But the second body, the sacral soma, is perpetual, as the cooperation of all the people and the mystical union of the kingdom, which is contained within the natural body. But this trapatized scheme does not quite exhaust the abstract physiological fiction of the premier Yoruba king. The, the Yoruba worldview has positioned sovereignty at the borderline, not only between the perishable natural body and the immaculate corporate body, but also between the human and more than the human. The only is divine. He is God. He is God King. We have so far identified three bodies of the Yoruba sacred king. Body natural, body politic, and divine incarnation. There is a fourth body that is linked to the land. 
in the medieval European art form representing the real body of the king, the physical body, the torso, is made up of little peoples, and the whole body is fused with the land. The king is an embodiment of the land and its people. Some African communities also have a similar conception of their kings. French anthropologist Jim Perret went here in his study of the king of Macon in the western islands of Cameroon, that is in his book called The Port King, identified three bodies of the king, the physical body, the body as a palace, and the body as a city. The Oni is also the body of Elefe. He is the body of the sacred center that is Elefe. The city of Elefe is the focal point in which the divine meets the corporal. The city is also the point of intercession between heaven, earth, and the underworld. The Oni Palace stands in the exact center of all that existed and all that will exist. The person of the Oni is also the focal point in which the divine and the land meet the fleshly body. The sacred king and the ruler of the city is the city itself. Because that's why the, the road that meets in the city all is called the march of the king. Roads are called march of the king. So the land actually, the Oni is symbolic of the land. So, so the, the, the king Oni Ile, actually that is what, what it means. The, the Oni Ile means, Oni means owner of land. That's why so one of the titles of the, of the king is Oni Ile. The word Oni means owner. Then that's Oni Ile. So for he, as the successor to Odudua, embodies the land that belongs to him and which he also symbolizes. The Oni seems to condense the mythical imagination of the sacred city and the sacred people in one place in his sacred corporality. Now, so now we have um, so far four bodies of the um, um, uh, four, four bodies of the king. Following Walter Cannon, this, this is a literary critic, I would like to name the fifth body as a textual body, as a, as, as a significant way to understand the relationship between the king and the subject, master and servant, and, and the nature of obedience. Here I want us to focus on the role of festival, liturg liturgical acclamation, doxologies, in the structure and functioning of power. What Olupona describes so well as festival and rituals are the center of the political apparatus of the Ife monarchy to build public consensus for its leadership. The festival and public rituals are the social communication on which, the, on which rests the public agreement for the king's dominance and his vital role in securing the sacred canopy, the civil religion. The, the festival also connects with what the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agabin calls the glorious and the active dimension of government. The construction of the textual body of the Oni is not limited to festival. He is the center of numerous oral narratives in the Ifa campus. Overall, the textual body serves to paper over the inevitable gap that exists between the Oni's metaphysical claim to power, his divine status, and the particularity of his flesh and blood. As Canon puts it, the textual body is the presentation deployed by the monarch, ceremony, exhortation, proclamation, speech, gesture, which finally must be constructed, read, and interpreted by the people. The more unified or seamless the textual presentation is read, and the more unconscious the people are that they are actually constructing this text, the more likely that the subject will accept the king's legitimacy. Let me now, so now, so, so the European model of two bodies does not explain Yoruba. Now you, you have all these forces, it's a much, much com, com, complex notion of kingship and sovereignty. Now let me connect my explanation of the five bodies of the king to the importance of number five in Yoruba mystical thought. My thesis is that the Oni in his royal body is, is a replica of creation. And a Magomundi, just as the Ifa divination tray is a woody reproduction of the original world order and its important axis of power. The lyrics of the diviner's, diviner's invocation of Ifa is intoned as follows Front of Ifa, back of Ifa, right side of Ifa, the all knowing on the left, the center of Ifa, and the center of heaven. So the five is important. And in, in the longer paper, I did show how, once you understand this, that not only the Ifa tree represents the world, the Oni in his body represents these five centers of the world. And until 
you come to the breakthrough point where you understand these five bodies, all of a sudden, it opens up also what is happening with the EFA. Now, based on that, I now said, from the Onis five body, we can draw out the principles of interreligious dialogue between not only African traditional religion, but Christianity and Islam. I said, so I said these five bodies also, uh, there are political philosophies, political theologies that tell us how life people could coexist to, to, uh, together, how the Oni or the kinship can still function as a rallying point for unity. And I said, Olukpona in his last two chapters of the book focus on the conflict between Pentecostals and the worshippers of various Orisha. Here I want to suggest some guiding principles for such a dialogue between the two groups. I will draw them out from the theory of the king's five body. That is from Yoruba's sacred kingship tra tradition. This way of drawing out the principle for Pentecostal navigation of the political commons in a sacred city is to underline the fact that the dialogue partners are not bringing their specific principles to the others, but are to discover them among other religions. For, for the ingredients of peaceful coexistence are already there in the other's political theology. What Africa needs is already there within the tradition, <laughs> African traditional religion. The, the first body of the king is the physical body, the biological body. This body that he shares with all human beings points to the in inherent quality uh, equality of all human beings who are created in the image of God. The theological idea is that all persons enjoy inherent di 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 dignity because they are created in the image and likeness of God endowed with reason and freedom. The dynamic equivalent of this Christian principle in African traditional religion is that all human beings have Ese, Teme, She, or Sum Sum in the Akan tradition, a central unifying vitality in them. They are ontologically connected. This principle demands that Pentecostal treat the, the religious order with respect and dignity because they all create an image of God. The, the second body of the king refers to the social collective or the social, the cooperation of the people in the giving kingdom. The dynamic equivalent of this notion in African traditional religion is the corporate essa or son son moten. There is a corporate spirit or the or this the, 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 the collective in Africa is not a melting point that boils away or boils down distinction and particularities. The corporate body of the king point to the network focus of the different members of the community towards the common good. The need for right relationship at all levels and spheres and get us to the hope of full realization of citizens' potential so that they can contribute to the paramount goal of society, which is the preservation and promotion of the common good. The divine body of the king is symbolic of the community's need for a relationship with, with an ultimate concern. As a symbol, it points and participates in what it points. Similarly, a community collective action must not only point towards God, but also participate in the dynamic divine ontological cre uh, cre creativity. The, com 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 the community, the African community, whether Ife or anywhere, stands in as stands out of God. In the terminology of the African traditional religion, all of nature and human socialities are open to the more than the divine realm, to the dimension of the transcendent. Who or what is that God? In a pluralistic society, we must allow people to define for themselves who or what that their ultimate concern is. This means that we must solve, we must not solve common problem by insisting that everybody must believe in the same God. And I'm saying this because even Oluk Pona's two, uh, either the one on Ondo or if uh, he has always said, look, Nigeria cannot operate on a secular basis, that, that the religion must be allowed to play their some role. The, the third body of the king is the land body. The king is the embodiment or the guardian of the earth, the environment that sustain life. Traditional Yoruba ethics is aimed at the restoration of, 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 of maintenance of the right relationship with the environment. And therefore, the respect for the environment, the respect for the land must also become a principle for public dialogue among, among the religion. And then, finally, is, is the king textual body. Which, if you have read his work from the beginning, his first essay he ever published as a graduate student at BU to now, is always because about the role that symbols, values, shared uh, uh, norms play in preserving the, the, the public school, in preserving the sacred uh, canopy, or recreating it when it, it, it has different. So when we look at those festivals as the king's 
textual body is points beyond the king to the need for a commonly shared uh, uh, symbols and values and festival that bind a society together. And this is something the Pentecostals are also used to, I mean, creating identity. And, and therefore, festival, some of these festivals must be seen along those lines. And I think Pentecostals and others need to join hands with that. And I think this provides some principle to initiate an interfaith dialogue or interreligious dialogue within the Ilay faith tradition. Thank you. some questions, so I, ha I prepared two. Um, one, as some of you in the audience know, I've had the privilege of participating in your course on Christianity in Africa. And in that class, you underscore the history of Christianity on the continent since its inception, and uh, the continuity of Christian practice in Sub-Saharan Africa since the earliest missions. But in this book, you seem to suggest there's a radical discontinuity between the earlier forms of missionization that tolerated, to a large degree, the indigenous civil society, which was founded on the traditional religious values and precepts, and then the, the discontinuity between them and the current strain of this American-style evangelical Pentecostal religion that has demonized African traditions and has force, forces a radical break with the past, both a personal and a collective radical break. So I'd like you to comment on the ramifications of this for civil society, and in particular for tolerance of religious pluralism, uh, which is so much at issue today in Nigeria. That's my first question. You want to hear them both at once, or just? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, yes. Yes, OK. So while you cogitate on that, here's the second. Um, in saying, as you have, that all study of African religion must take account of issues of gender and power, you have been a pioneer, especially among African scholars, male African scholars. So I'd like you to say more about this, the basis of your position. Um, for example, do you believe that Yoruba religion and African religion, or African religions in general, uh, take a radically different position on gender than the position of other world religions? Are you suggesting that it's necessary to use gender as an analytical tool to understand African religions and not to misinterpret them? What are you really saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, can I? Well, um, thank you very much. Let me thank both of you for comments. And, uh, so my colleagues that I'm now seeing who have read the manuscript or read the book, so I, I want to thank you. Relating to the first question, um, I write not uh, simply because I am a professor, a scholar of religion. I'm also uh, witnessing to you know the, what is transformation. It's very hard for people who do not know or lived in the Nigeria of the 50s and 60s to appreciate what is going on and what I have not fully seen. And that's why my, yeah, my book about my father is very important because those stories are there. When uh, in, in times of conflict, uh, the traditionalists are doing their thing, and the Christians in the Anglican tradition wanted to come out to disturb a festival where uh, the tenets, uh, the women must not come out. And it's just for one hour or so. And the Christians said, no, we're coming out. We're going to challenge them. And the king sent a chief to my father. Please tell him, tell Reverend, the usual called pastor, that I am still in town, that I'm in charge. And so, as a trained priest with seminary education, uh, uh, um, so I spent time in, in Bristol, he was well educated, he got the message that you must not disturb the peace, you must respect the king. He owns the land, like you just said. The land belongs to him. Mm -hmm. And so they had to find a way of walking around it 
a kind of a negotiation that respected the sacred kingship, but at the same time did not capitulate to threat. So they actually went out, but they did not disturb the festival. That is a different story today. So we see this kind of trajectory that uh, we uh, that uh, uh, moved us from the that time of Anglicanism to the contemporary period of Pentecostal charismatic thing. The difference between the two, of course, the middle point is the independent African churches. The period before Pentecostalism in 1780 uh, 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 period. And that we would describe as the period of the Africanization of Christianity. That is, Africanization of colonial Christianity. So we brought in drums, we started changing things. We wanted to make Africa very, uh, well, Christianity very African. That was the period. So there was a need for a kind of a negotiation between orthodoxy, orthodox Christianity, and this new faith tradition. And independent African churches flowered all over the world, you know. And then we moved to the next stage, where there's a change, a kind of, not only a, kind of a parallel change, but almost a sort of a, a change in a world view that we may describe as a, a, almost a Christianization, or re-Christianization, of this original Orthodox Christianity. In other words, we are not too happy with this form of Christianity because the Christianity is mixed with culture. So we need to do something about it. Yeah. And these are general terms. It doesn't mean that all Pentecostal charismatic churches behave the same. But there's a trend in which, you know, and this is what is given back to this thing. Whereby the kings are now going to the uh, assemblies and prayer houses of the Pentecostal pastors to <coughs> kneel before them and ask for prayer. It was the opposite. <laughs> and so uh, very few of us are qualified to, to document this. And for me, it's not just an academic exercise. I saw it. I lived it. I saw even, even evangelical Christianity within the first, first realm. My grandfather was uh, you know, a Christian catechist, but at the same time, he was a chief. And he refused to go to the king's palace to swear to take the oath of office. He said he would do that. So my father, as a pastor, came in to, to do this negotiation. And what was it? That he would go to the, to, to the king's palace to take his title, but he would use the Bible yeah. to take the oath of office. Uh -huh. So I, I, I so having seen this, I find that very hard not to be faithful to it, uh, or to, to make sure that my own personal experiences uh, will also uh, relate to my interpretation of the traditions that I'm saying. So they say, with the way in which there's a continuity with you know, the old Christianity, but there's also a break. The second uh, uh, question relating to gender, I, 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 it was a radical conversion. Because when I first did that book of own do things, I didn't take gender seriously. It was not in book. Mm -hmm. And yet, if there's any particular place in Yoruba land where gender was very central, it was the own do place. Mm -hmm. Because that was the only kingdom that was founded by a woman. Mm -hmm. So the next thing I did, as soon as I discovered that, was to ask a, PA, a, a, a Harvard PhD student, Elizabeth Ames, to do to, uh, to recommend to her to do field research in Bordeaux. People were shocked. You are sending a French PhD student to go to the place where you did your work. You are not afraid of competition. They didn't know what was behind it. <laughs> but I said, no, what is competition? It's when you are not sure of yourself that yeah. you'll be afraid of co competing with who? <laughs> <laughs> so I encourage that. So Elizabeth James did that. You know, her book is coming out uh, very soon. It took her some, you know, years to, to revise it. But it's coming out very soon. So it was important. I, 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 then I discovered that the gender is so central to this society, to the Yoruba culture. And it takes scholars like us to uh, able to read between the lines to give these kinds of meaning and interpretation to that. And this is one of the reasons why people in the diaspora are, are, are fascinated by the Yoruba stories. The story of Oshu, for example, mm -hmm. as a goddess who took part in uh, creation, but who was excluded by the other gods. And when the gods ran into trouble because the world was not properly created, they came back to Olodumare to complain. And I looked around, looked around and I said, what is that woman that went with you? And he said, oh, it's, it's somewhere in the kitchen doing that. 
I say, that is the source of your problem. You go back and, and so they did the kind of a negotiation in the, you know, I'm just trying to simplify the ocean story. But, but, but African American uh, scholars in literature and so have used that effectively in their, in their interpretation. In fact, it became a kind of a motif for talking about gender in the diaspora, the kind of pan-African uh, reinterpretation of gender. So let me stop it. Floor is open. Yes. Yes, I have uh, questions uh, for Jacob, and uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you for this wonderful book, which I haven't yet read, and which I hope to read very soon. Uh, I know that um, your expertise is not just in Yoruba and Yoruba religion, but also in Islam and Christianity, and I also know that you are doing research now on Boko Haram and more recent developments in Nigeria. Now, I remember that about 30 years ago, David Dayton wrote mm -hmm. a paper and a book, you know, uh, on uh, titled uh, Hegemony and the Cross Cultures in Nigeria, right. in which he makes, I think, the right point, at least at that time, yes. that um, uh, in Yoruba land, uh, there is no politicization of religious liberties. Yes. That's why people lived peacefully that the Christian, Muslims, etc. So, and I, I, I believe that the religious tolerance, uh, you know, peaceful coexistence in Yoruba land is something that is remarkable compared to any other uh, place of Africa that I have known. Uh, so my question is, with the recent rise, with the rise of a charismatic and Pentecostal movement, you know, started in the 60s and from the West to the to the other parts of uh, Nigeria, and also the rise of Islamist right. fundamentalist movement, and more recently, the rise of uh, jihad Islam. To what extent has that affected Yoruba land and you know peaceful uh, ex uh, religious co existence, coexistence in Yoruba land? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, something that I would like you to, to 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 comment on. For example, the Boko Haram. Yeah. Do they have any impact? In among the Yoruba Muslims. I know that Izala did not in the in the eighties when I did my research on Nigeria. So so this uh, new jihadi and more extremist uh, manifestation of Islam, to what are they well, well received in Yoruba? And I remember that uh, Leighton, when explaining uh, peaceful coexistence in Yoruba land, he says because this uh, ancestral city identity uh, was more important than the religion. Yeah. That's how he explained yeah. why Muslims and Christians could uh, live peacefully and that people, mm -hmm. uh, in, in one family you may find Christians and Muslims who would celebrate Christian and Muslim holidays, etc. So uh, I, so my question, I guess, is what is happening now? To yeah. what extent are, uh, have these uh, religious ideologies affected peaceful coexistence in the yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, you, you probably uh, noticed that he referred to a, a, a pastor, a reverend gentleman in that book. That's right. my father. Oh, yes, yes, that was my late, that was my late father. Uh, because he did a field research in, uh, in, uh, in Ilife. Mm -hmm. the, the, the narratives uh, uh, came from there. Mm -hmm. And um, he was right in you know, uh, pushing the ancestral city uh, thesis and arguing that religion uh, in among the Yoruba people uh, doesn't constitute any major major threat. In southwestern Nigeria right now, there are about five states. Four of the governors are Muslims. You know, four of the governors, actually three. One, uh, the governor of my home state, who is a Christian, he was actually from a long, you know, I mean, Itism is not a Christian, it's a Muslim, because his, grand, his father was uh, was a Seriki Muslim of, of this thing. So he, he was, um, he, he probably just con uh, converted more recently. Mm -hmm. And he was my junior in high school. Mm -hmm. So uh, Southwestern Nigeria is going to be the saving grace of Nigeria as far as religion is concerned. Mm -hmm. If the Boko Haram phenomena enters that place, and Yoruba uh, Christianity and Islam and, and, and Yoruba states become the zone for religious conflicts, <laughs> That is the end of Nigeria. We can predict that. So we, we hope and pray that it doesn't happen. It is because in that part of the, the land, Islam and Christianity crisscross. My father never told me 
that his mother came from a, a, a Muslim heritage, I mean, a family in O. He didn't say that. I just noticed one day that, uh, you know, we're having a, something in the village, and all the people that came from, uh, from O, you know, the mother's hometown, they were Muslims. And I called one of my uncle and said, ah, isn't there a Christian among you? And he started laughing. He said, your father didn't tell you that the mother was a, was almost a, was a Muslim? I didn't know. Because it was not, you know. So in other words, if you start fighting on the basis of uh, religion, or you, you're fighting your own king's group, or your own king's yeah, exactly. it's not It's not artificial. It, it's, there is no major Muslim family that doesn't have Christian uh, 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 family members, and vice versa. Yeah. Right now, there are rumors that these things are happening. Uh, they have discovered some Boko Haram cells in, in southwestern Nigeria. But I think the problem is that Boko Haram, you know, has become almost something that everybody is, you know, all the renegades are claiming that they're Boko Haram. We really don't know who is Boko Haram, you know. So I, we have a feeling that a number of people who are claiming that they're members of the Boko Haram, they're not really Boko Haram. Uh, so, however, some Western uh, 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 state governors are not just sitting and watching. They are very, very sensitive to what is going on. And they will do everything humanly possible to make sure that it doesn't happen. There are interfaith groups in all, most of the towns who meet regularly. The security is quite, is quite strong. Um, uh, uh, however, Given these changes we are seeing in the religious spheres, particularly what you refer to as this radical Islam and, 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 and fundamentalist uh, uh, Pentecostal charismatic thing, it's not impossible for these open conflicts. It's not impossible. Uh, but we just hope that it doesn't, so far, it's not, it's not happening. And, um, uh, 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 but part of the problem is also the nation state. Nigeria can be described as a fair state. You know, I mean, I was there uh, a month ago, and I made it that we don't need to be into theory of this is the first state. This is the signs are there, so we all need to work hard to make sure that it doesn't it doesn't collapse, um, given what what we see. Yeah. Could you please comment about the uh, supremacy between Alafi of Oyo and Oni of Ife? Uh, oh, the, 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 in your conflict? Yes. Yeah, okay. Because they cannot see eye to eye yeah. in Yoruba. Okay. Well, yeah. The, the old Yoruba kingdom uh, that uh, went with the transatlantic slave trade was the Oyo Empire. Before the Oyo Empire was the ancient Ife, the city that you know uh, became the focus of my work. And then, of course, uh, uh, civilizations will rise and fall if, uh, you know, uh, if uh, civilization uh, almost collapsed. And then the emergence of the old Oyo Empire that existed till the time of slavery, uh, that uh, extended to Dahomey and to Bini and so on. So, and then uh, the British came and the British uh, uh, pacification. And since then, there's been these two, these two groups: the old Yoruba Ilife, and then the Oyo thing. What happened was that when the colonial government came, the colonial government, and I mentioned that in the book find a way of appointing, the, of making the, the, or the, the king of the kings. He virtually anointed him based on this myth and uh, mythic you know, uh, uh, stories. And historically, that has always been that. When they are going to form the major party, political party, that dominated southwestern Nigeria, the late chief Awolowo came to Ife and, you know, and created the, that whole story. The Yoruba myth of origin became the basis for the formation of the action group. And in fact, it was the cultural association called Egbeoma Odudua. When there was, uh, Akitola became a renegade and wanted to form his own party, he couldn't move after that, that, outside that Asian myth of Ife. And he called his Egbeoma Olofi. Olofi is simply the honorific title for Odudua. There's no difference between those two stories. So in other words, what we are seeing in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, am I, are you taping me? Well, okay, what you are seeing, what you are seeing in the Oyo, we are, you know, what you are seeing in the Oyo and Ilefe, it's a, uh, I think it's just a clash between two personalities. Mm. 
the story of Yoruba is clear. If it was the place of origin, Oyo became the empire, and Oyo fell. You know, that's why uh, in the diaspora, uh, the city called Oyo Tunji, where a group of uh, Utopian uh, uh, African American community, they call it Oyo Tunji. It's a reference to that Oyo empire, the resurgence, the recreation of the renaissance of the old Oyo empire. So um, we are not happy about the, the conflict, but there's no, no context between all of Alafia and there's no context between Alafia and, and all the Fife. All the, that's the city of the Yoruba. That's the center of it. Uh, both of them are important. Both of them, you know, are making uh, meaningful contributions to Yoruba civilization. But to be arguing that uh, Oyo is, 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 is supreme or, or Oyo is uh, more central than Ilife, I think it's a, it's a misgiving. Um, there's no, there's no, no support, there's no proof of that. It's all politics. And of course, a lot of people are benefiting from this conflict mm -hmm. between these two, 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 uh, two leaders. I'd like to tack along with Professor Khan's question, yes. with the, the case of Christianity yes. and the sort of attack on the sacred canopy or divine kingship, mm -hmm. you can pretty clearly chase trace it to the, the roots of um, modern evangelical Pentecostal Christianity, as you've mm. in your book. But in the case of Islam, even though there, were, there was always a little bit of tension, Islam, when it was introduced uh, into the, the indigenous cosmology, mm. didn't really challenge the sacred kingship in the same way. In fact, many of the kings, as you've mm. written about yourself, became Muslims themselves, and there wasn't yeah. much of an issue. Yeah. But now, if you're in most of the major Yoruba cities, you can hear over the speaker phones and the mosques, imams telling people, even some of them who go to see the traditionalists themselves, mm -hmm. not to go see the Babalao, not to, they, they really challenge the, uh, the indigenous framework. Really? And so where do you see the roots of that form of intolerance or that challenge on the case of Islam? Yeah, the world has become very global. So it's a global village. And there are lots of impacts and influences from other parts of Nigeria and also outside Nigeria. It's, it's, it's a, so this kind of global, um, like you said, Islamicism, and the global Pentecostal charismatic uh, uh, movements, uh, they all affecting culture and tradition and society uh, 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 today. So because people cannot live in isolation, there's always you know, movement. And within Nigeria itself, you know, the, the, the fact that they move back and forth, uh, a number of these communities are in northern part of Nigeria, in Kado, in Kaduna. They used to be in Jos, and then they come back, and you know, uh, and 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 there was a time when uh, the best uh, scholars of Islam were Yorubas in Nigeria. The best scholars of Islam who were professors of Islam in northern states, they were all Yoruba. Uh, but to 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 point to these these kinds of tradition, this tradition of Yoruba, I will give you one example. Uh, uh, before Saudi Arabia decided to ban Ahmadis from doing the, 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 the Hajj, a number of Yoruba intellectuals and scholars were Ahmadis, including Professor of Islam. The three, I, I have three most distinguished professors of Islam were Ahmadis. The school that, I mean, they went to McGill, Ibadan McGill, they came, they created the Department of Islamic and Arabic Studies, and they were producing, you know, PhD candidates. And then all of a sudden, Saudi Arabia said, you must not do, you can't do the hat because you belong to this Ahmadi. Ahmadi is a sect in, that originated from Pakistan, and then that uh, still talked about, um, uh, uh, they know the ultimate of, of the Prophet Muhammad, that they're still a prophet after the Ahmadi, uh, after uh, Muhammad. So they pounced on them, and they declared that. You know what happened after that? Our professors of Islam publicly now denounced Ahmadi. So you will be asking us that people who were well trained in Islam, who were quite in there, why did they remain Ahmadi until, uh, until Saudi Arabia pounced on them and said, no, this is a, it's, it's a heretical movement? Is it that they didn't know before? That is the thing. That's the nature of Yoruba. That was not an issue. They went to Ahmadi schools. They benefited from it. They didn't see any problem in somebody coming up and say, "Well, I'm still going. I'm still a prophet. I'm still a valid prophet, and uh, I come after Muhammad." They didn't consider it to be anything. You know what? They weren't really Yoruba. Don't spend too much time talking about doctrines of faith. It's the practice of tradition. You know that's the nature of that whole thing. 
But so 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 but when doctrinal issues are now introduced as we are now seeing today, is you know is bound to create problems and crises. Yeah. Yes. Uh, clarification on the Ahmadin. Yes. They were one of the original groups to bring Islam to America. Yeah. But I thought they were um, conceived as being uh, heretical at that particular time. And uh, their bringing of Islam to America was a continuation of, of uh, yeah. the disruption of orthodoxy. Yeah. Is that? Yes. It's, it's a, a do you remember the year when Saudi Arabia? It was in the 70s. In the 70s. But this is the 1900s. Oh, 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 yes. Yeah. Well, there were, you see, Ahmadi movement, Ahmadi movement uh, in, southern, in southwestern Nigeria, particularly in the Yoruba religion, uh, uh, Yoruba area, I would say Ahmadi was the group that both brought modernity to southwestern Nigeria. They were, they came in full force. They were the ones that used the method of the Western missionaries, which is build schools, build hospitals, uh, 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 establish social services, and, and people will convert. So people seized on that. If I did, their schools rivaled the Christian mission schools, yeah. you know, during that period. So nobody saw any problem with that. So you are right that a part of the history of, of course, Islam in in North America, uh, particularly among African Americans, was that a number of these sects came from different places and they went to uh, places in Michigan and you know, all these places where they now establish uh, schools and built um, uh, hospitals and, and, and converted uh, people to, to Islam. That was exactly what happened in western part of Nigeria. In fact, I, I would say in in other areas of West Africa too, uh, maybe Senegal, Ivory Coast, you know, they made significant impact. And nobody saw anything wrong in that because nobody discussed doctrine. Until then, you know, this, this uh, uh, edict uh, uh, came from Saudi Arabia that sort of, you know, uh, said to them, you cannot come, you can't, be, you can't come here. Right, that these people were no longer Golden Muslims. Actually, it was a, um, following a campaign by the Jamaat Islami in Pakistan, by Prof. Maududi, uh, that you know, the Organization of Islamic Conference decided that the Ahmadi were the truth in the Before we break up our formal session, one more question for Professor Pat. Oh, um, yeah, um, Jacob, I just want to congratulate you again on oh, the publication of this extraordinary book. And I actually want to. Um, ask you to reflect as a historian of religion on um, Hila Ife and I have a, a modern or postmodern aspect to my question. Okay. One of the most important contributions that the book makes, and I've told you this so often, is it um, really follows Wheatley's uh, vision yeah. and it um, compels historians of religion around the world to place Hila Ife in consideration, yeah. imperative and symbolic consideration with the great what they had act called the great orthogenetic cities, right. which, um, such as Benares and Jerusalem, Tenochtitlan, as Carrasco has shown us, right. and, and the great meaning producing cities where, the, uh, as you say, the cosmos is, um, is both created and then reproduced, and You're it right. serves as a kind of paradigm for the culture. And You're it's right. um, the book really um, insists that you know, if they become part of that part larger of that discourse. comparative discourse about mm -hmm. cities. And one thing I was thinking about, um, I'd love to hear you comment, are we in this country impoverished of that type of city? Because it seems as though, not only because of our youth, but because of the, uh, the struggles, the agon of our history, that we, um, and because of the separation of church and state, right. mm -hmm. uh, our, our pluralism, one of our great strengths, but are we, will we ever see such a city in this country? It almost seems as though in Washington, D.C., um, there was an attempt to almost self-consciously create uh, yeah, such right. a city, but I'm not sure if it ever could be a city like Ileife or yeah. like uh, Jerusalem or Tenochtitlan. What do you think about, yes. about that? Yeah, 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 thank you. Um, I, I, it's going to be, uh, because our own uh, constitution uh, in this country is defined in you know, secular terms, um, and even though we know that religion uh, plays a very important role in the day-to-day -day, uh, 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 lives of Americans, 
he doesn't have that kind of, you know, as you know, doesn't have that kind of status, uh, so to say. Uh, uh, and what is interesting about uh, civil religion, which is also connected with it, is that there are two types. One, it is assumed that any functioning community, society, must have this sense of rituals and myths that you name them. So it's almost natural civil religion. But uh, Toguzo, who also uh, debated that, uh, and I think Bella commented on it, is that it can also be created. You see, it can be created to unify a diverse groups of people. So we know within America itself, uh, 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 civil religion has helped to cement you know, uh, communities and provinces uh, into one. That's why Bella's uh, single article in 1967, I think, uh, became, was it 76 or I can't remember the day, became so pivotal in, in, you know, in dealing with that. But what is also interesting and why this model that we discuss is, you know, uh, is fascinating is that in all the places where it's been used to study cities, the, you know, the, the model has been used to study cities, there are also, also contradictions within those cities there. One of the things that, that, that it fascinates me with Ife relates to the prayer that my father used to give when he was there and there were conflicts. If every day they were fighting, if I was fighting Modekeke, and that has to do with the, with the, the prayer in reference to Jerusalem. You know, Badura Fun, Alafi, at Jerusalem, I want to pray, you see, Shirley, you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and those who, you know, love the city, what is that? Um, yeah. As a prison there. Well, you know that, that is, he will start his litany without prayer. We were in Ilefe, he was talking about Ife, so to say. But the, the prayer has to do with the Jerusalem prayer, you know, in the, in the, um, in the Bible. And, and I began to now make this connection that within this cityscape itself, you have serious conflicts, just like what is happening in Jerusalem, just like other secret cities, you know, that, that uh, scholars have, have studied. And then I found Diana X work very fascinating, you know, um, when I was doing my research in the early 80s in Nigeria, um, the city of Banaras was one of the, the I'd like to write you, you rightly said, one of the books I read um, and, and studied uh, 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 well. So, um, as a historian of religion, I'm attracted to this phenomenon. I'm attracted to those models. But I also insist that the world history is missing in, the, in our scholarship. And that we need to be able to show you know, especially, so, so to say, not only especially, but also historically in terms of the evolution of religion in those cities. So that we can truly call ourselves historians of religion, not just that we are phenomenologists, so to say, but that we can discuss religious transformation in cities, in time and space. Yeah.